guess we're going to have a little uh, change in our operational plans for today because uh, I didn't put my long winter underwear on and it's blowing and cold out there. So uh, I think we're going to try to show some slides and talk about planter equipment adjustments and uh, doing interceedings here. Uh, later on, if you want to see the equipment, the, and I want to stand outside for about 10 or 15 minutes. We'll go out and look at it and go from there. But uh, to stand there for two hours this afternoon uh, just may be a little chilly. You know, uh, there is some snowflakes flying. And uh, uh, I've had one field day one year back in the early 70s. And I don't know whether Bob was there or close to being there, I think. Uh, we actually had snow. And we didn't have a facility like this. It was an open barn. And it was... That was a tough field day that day. You know. So, uh, uh, so my son got it, or my grandson got a drone, and uh, for Christmas, and he's really excited. So he took some drone pictures, and I thought you might like to see the facility here. So if you look, uh, if you look right here, this is our house, and of course this is the old farmstead. Uh, and then here we are in our machinery shed that become a uh, warehouse, uh, which is real tough to find a room to work on equipment during the cover crop season, as you can imagine. And then our new facility, which is right here, this is a cleaning facility, and before you leave, if you would like to see it, the doors will be open, and you can visually see our new clipper cleaner, uh, our bagging facility up there, uh, Jay and Ann has pretty well designed and worked on that uh, with, with me dragging my feet because I had to write the checks. <laughs> yeah, darn dad, they say. Uh, so I have to convince them they need to crawl a little bit and clean some seed before he goes buys a million dollar colored sorter and some kind of gravity crater that runs things uphill instead of down. And, whatever happens to it. So uh, if you need some seed clean, let us know because we can then we can buy some new, more toys, you know. Uh, but what we wanted to show you was the cover, you know, and we try very diligently and for the past three to four years we've been 100% covered. Uh, usually have it done by Thanksgiving, this year we were a little late with my wife with cancer treatments and knee surgery and hip surgery and some other things that happened to us. Uh, we didn't get done seeding cover crops till the day before Christmas. And guess what? You're just now seeing a little red tent from the rye growing. And hopefully, before the first of May, it'll warm up and it'll grow a little bit, you know. Uh, but that's one of those years. Uh, and you came here, so you probably saw it was pretty brown all the way around us, you know. So, uh, this is what's left after a 10 way species. Uh, there's crimson clover, hairy vetch, winter peas, and rye. Uh, and what left was all the summer grasses and summer legumes that we put in there after wheat harvest. We try to do our big monster cover after cereal grains. Uh, it used to be always after all the wheat, but uh, we're not growing as much wheat as we did. We're growing more rye, pitocales, uh, barley, uh, oats for the seed business. Uh, so about 70% uh, of all our cereals now are for the cover crop business and still don't have enough grown. And uh, so that's where we're at there. Uh, this is just a field. Of, uh, this was CRP clear up to, to 16. It came out in September the 21st of 16. Uh, we were able to work with our NRCS office to convince them to uh, let us do a, a chemical burn down of the 10 year CRP, which was uh, cool season grasses and uh, multiple wooded species. Uh, you know? And. Uh, so in August, we went in there with a quart and a half of uh, Roundup, burned everything off, and planted a 10-way species. Uh, this happens to have five species left. 
Uh, if you remember last spring, uh, it was pretty nice in April, so our conventional guys were all done planting the 21st of April. The 22nd of April, we had a six inch rainfall event. The 10th of May, they replanted that corn. 15th day of May, we had a seven inch rainfall event. They replanted the corn the last day of May, and that's when we started. So here we are, the last day of May, planting corn. We took the corn planter down to the CRP field that had the cover in, made a half around with the planter. Of course, we don't have guidance because I'm not smart enough to do that. And uh, broke about 35 shear pins, and as big as I am, and four steps in and out of a tractor, I was getting a little upset, as you can see. So I called my wife, and we says, bring the roller, and we rolled ahead of planting. This is the first year we ever rolled ahead of planting. We always roll afterwards because there's some secrets. I'll show you later on here why we like to roll afterwards. So here we are. Uh, this we bought this 3020 in 71. That's when I started no-tilling. It has uh, I don't know how many hours. It's turned over three times on attacks or whatever that is. But anyhow, it's still running, pulling the 20-foot roller. Uh, she's running about five or six mile an hour. And you can see it's a, it was a mess because there's a little hairy batch sticking on the wings of the roller. But here we're rolling the cover just before planting, you know. Now I really like this design of this roller because it tends to look work like a mower hay bind. It actually crimps it, so every four or five inches it crimps that residue. If that residue is in the boot stage or bloom, we can terminate with this roller. <coughs> So what this does, this saves us the first herbicide pass, whichever you call it, you know, burn down pass or whatever. Now it does take about a week longer to turn it brown than if you use a herbicide. And that's one problem David has, I like to see it turn brown immediately. Uh, you know, if it's green for three weeks, you get a little worried. You gotta learn to have patience, you know, or go fishing or do something, you know. Yeah, hobby, right. But here you can see the hairy batch and, and everything. It's in bloom, doing a really nice job of taking care of things. And here we are planting into it. Uh, we just got, this is, uh, we planted 400 acres of corn last summer, or last spring. And this was one of the last fields, of course. But what I wanted to show you was look at the tractor and look at the planter. There's no dust on it. It takes 20% less fuel for us to plant corn in the cover crop than it does for us to plant my, my uncle's conventional stuff just because the planter sinks in and pulls harder, you know. So to me, that's a savings of about a quart and a half or two quart of diesel fuel per acre. That don't seem like much, but if you put that on 500 or 1,000 acres, you know, you can at least go out and buy a steak for supper some night, you know. Uh, we utilize the fluted colder mainly because we got rocks just underneath the surface about as big as a basketball. We tried running, you know, we, we've done the whole gamut of, you know, whatever come out from 1971 till now we've had. Luckily, two weeks ago, we had an inventory reduction sale and we had like uh, 60 some different row cleaners, uh, 45 different kinds of spike wheels. And we had them on skids and guess what? They brought just about as much money as they cost me when I bought them new, so well, that was a like, good thing. That looks like that thing stopped now. Yeah, it stopped. Yeah, it stopped again. Yeah. So we're back to a fluted colder with a seed disc in the, behind that and then rubber press wheels in behind, you know. And you can see it's doing a nice job. You, you can see that corn, that's non-treated corn in the box, and we're off and running. But what I want to show you is we're moving no soil. You know, I think it panics all our neighbors when they see us do this, you know, and they shake their head. And of course, I guess if you, if you go down here to Carroll to the Greasy Spoon, where everybody meets for breakfast and we don't have time to go there, but there's a big calendar that says, how long will Dave Brant be farming? And they keep changing the years, you know? <laughs> so, uh, we'll see. Uh, but here we're just wanting to show you a little movie. We had rolled this the opposite direction, you know, we go to meetings, well, you can't, you gotta roll the same direction, you gotta make sure you do it right, you know, and all this crap. Well, here, we're running against the way we roll, you know. The wheels aren't really smooth, so we're running about four mile an hour, four and a half. Uh, this happens to be a first year no-till field. 
that wasn't in CRP, so we're actually putting two and a half gallon of a starter fertilizer on the seed. You know. You covered all your poking things, so you can go that direction. Yeah, so we can go that direction, right. Uh, if it happens to spring up, you, you can't do that because it will wrap on the shafts and the chains, you know. Uh, we found that if we had road planters, we could make a round bale about 300 pounds and about 600 feet. <laughs> the only thing we couldn't figure out is how to put an otter assembly on it to get it done so we can make hay at the same time, you know. But here's our slit. Why do I like it? I mean, it, to me, it don't have to be closed. Just get it down there, you know, get it an inch and three quarters, two inches deep. Then use a crop roller to smack that cover crop down on top of it. We don't have the sunlight and the wind bothering us so it don't dry out. If we don't have this rink swell, swell that you do, and just without covers, you know, it's important to close the seeds hot, but to me it's not important. When I have this kind of residue, you know. So here's our results. Four days after planting corn. I hope you can see that corn plant. Hope you can see how green it is. You know, look at that residue. Guess what? When we have a three inch rainfall event in 30 minutes, we don't lose any soil. You know? Just imagine how that raindrop is so soaking through that residue. As it's soaking through that residue, it's taking nutrients from that residue, you know, and they call that, when they do that with manure piles or whether they're stirring stuff, you know, and doing all this work, you know, composting, you know, talk about compost, and they talk about compost tea. Well, compost tea is just the nutrients running out of that pile that they collect and use it in their fertilizer applications. I think we do it here right when the rainfall happens, you know, because every time we get a rainfall event, we see the corn getting greener. You know, and Lucas showed this this morning, you know, this is 30 pound of rye. We're going back to 20. I think 20 is going to be enough for us, you know. As long as you know what your herbicide program is and you don't lose half of it because the herbicide took it out, you know. And we don't have trouble because we've got lots of organic matter. We've got lots of critters that's helping eat up some of the longevity of our herbicides, you know. Here it is a little later on in the season. Look at the moisture on the leaves, you know. The real brown stuff is all legumes, so that means when it rains on it, it's washing some of that nitrogen off of those plants down into the soil, you know. Almost a picket stand offense. I, I like picket stands offenses, but guess what? In no-till, we've learned to use varieties that tend to have flexible ears. You know, I like some of these new varieties, but you look at them, and what they do, they put on a two and a half or three, three ounce ear. Maybe a two ounce ear. Well, no wonder they went 45 or 50,000 plants per acre. Because it takes 50,000 plants and an inch and an ounce and a half ear to make 200 bushel. You know, it's only that long. We used to call them nubbins. <coughs> you know? We get a flexible corn variety that we miss a kernel maybe once every two or three foot. And the next thing you know, you got an ear eight or nine inches long that weighs a pound. You know, maybe we should be going back to smaller densities so we can get our cover crops in on another thing. You know, maybe we should look at 30,000 or 28,000 with an upright leaf if we're going to do inner seedings. 40 inch corn, you know, wouldn't have trouble running over it that way. I put this picture in just because this happens to be NRCS new employees. We train four times a year here. We try to get new employees to understand how important soil health is. But I put that picture in there just to show you how dark that corn is after a cover crop with no fertilizer and no nitrogen. If you can see those leaves, there's not any lesions in them. They're dark green, no insects. Unlike Lucas, I, I pay an agronomist, and I think this is my last year to pay him, Lucas, because he thinks we've got to have all the herbicides, we've got to have all the newest corn, we've got to come in and do fungicide treatments, and the only way they want to do a fungi treatment here is do the whole field. So he comes to me, sits in the office here, and he says, David, this is what you've got to do this year because we're going to give you 10 more bushels of corn if you fly this fungicide on. I says, well, now, Carl, how do I know that? Well, it just says so in the literature. Well, I says, how about having that clean pilot leave half of it untreated? 
Well, I don't think he can do it. I says, if he can't do it, don't do it. We tried four years. We treated half fields. Guess what? In a healthy soil fertility thing like we have, when we do an insecticide with an airplane or a fungicide treatment, it costs me 35 to 50 bushel corn. And you want to hear my agronomist talk to me after that at corn harvest time. You know, best thing I can do is call him up and have him set the cab. You know, look here, this corn's making 130, and this corn wasn't treated, it's making 200. Now you want to sell me that again. Don't bill me for that plane ride. You know. Soil temperature, we have a lot to, we're 20 degrees cooler. We're not evaporating the water that's in the soil. We're having things grow. And I think Lucas has seen the same thing, you know. My neighbor's corn, same day, was 91 degrees. His soil was 91 degrees. Look at that stalk, it's showing phosphorus deficiency. How could it? He put 300 pounds of DAP on. He put 275 pounds of nitrogen on it. He vertical tilled four times, deep ripped in the fall. Got 16 gallon diesel fuel per acre on it. It's got to grow. You know? What I want to show you, look at that leaf. That leaf right there is telling me that corn means nitrogen. Can't get no oxygen. He says, he called me. He says, what am I supposed to do with my corn? It looks so bad. I said, you got a 16 row anhydrous applicator. He says, what does that mean to you? I says, just pull it out there and go put any anhydrous on. Get some air in that soil. Guess what? He did that in two passes and quit. He said, this is a bunch of crap. Guess what? Those 32, inch, 32 rows made 44 bushel more corn with no nitrogen. Just added air to it, broke the crust. You know? There's our soils. That's when we started, 1971. Half percent organic matter. Cardington clay based soils. You know? Got a soil scientist here, he's been here a few years, he's seen a change. He can validate what we're doing. This is our soils now. 8% organic matter. Do you realize what 8% organic matter means to Dave Brandt? That's 400 pounds of nitrogen in the soil. That's nine inches of water a year being held. Do I have to have rain? No. I like the rain. If it comes right, you know, I don't like it like it was yesterday. You saw all the puddles we have. I hope when you leave here, you don't see any puddles. Because that's how fast we'll infiltrate after it quits. You know? We talked about, we've seen the slate test, and we're not going to bother you with that. Uh, this just happens to be our soil. So this is my uncle. He's 96 years old. Continuous no-till soybeans, 25 years. This is one minute after the clog was put in the soil. Why do we allow this to happen with our neighbors? You guys aren't doing it because you're here. I know you got cover crops. Why can't we tell your neighbor, let's not lose the phosphorus, the nitrogen, the potash? My farmer neighbor was here a week ago, farms 10,000 acres. He was over to brag because he just finished putting on 100 ton of anhydrous last week. <laughs> You know, the Ohio River likes him real well. I guess that guy down there along the Ohio River that grows 500 acres of sweet corn and it's flooded today, he's thrilled to death. <laughs> you know, he's got all kinds of nutrients. Why do you do those kind of things? If we don't tell our neighbors, because I know you guys aren't doing it, and if we don't stop this, and we happen to have an algae bloom in Lake Erie, because we're too far south of Lake Erie, but let's just take it further. Let's just go down to New Orleans. And they have a larger kill than they got now, which is like 10 miles outside the, uh, the ocean. If it goes to 15 or 20 miles, EPA and everybody else is going to be telling us what to do. You know, and that's no fun. You know, here's my uncle. This is a moon you now. This is my uncle's soil. Just right down the road. If you don't believe me, left hand turn. Right hand turn, 500 feet down the road on the left hand side, you'll see it, you know. 
This is what we need. Do we need this? That rodent at 15 to 20 ton per acre? Guess what? That's a flat field. It's not even highly erodible. 15 ton of soil loss a year. A ton of soil is worth $40. You know, he's not concerned. But you know, 15 times 40 if you're going to replace it. And last year's beans were 25. He can't figure out why the yields are going down. You know, there we are. This is fun. This is our planter tractor. If you can see the planter mark out there, it's perfect. You can see it right there. It goes. It's about that crooked. You know, and I read, if I do that, I get a hell of a lot more corn in a row. You know, as long as the corn hit will pull it up, I don't care. Oh, yeah, there's a round bale out there, right there, you know? <laughs> but there's 36,000, here's 46,000 pounds of biomass after planting. That's five inches thick of thatch. We pulled a soil sample, sent it to Rick Haney. Five days later, he called me back. He said, David, he said, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I'm just having fun. <laughs> well, you know that field of soil you sent me? It's got 330 pounds of nitrogen. He says, what'd you do? I says, I planted corn. He says, you put nitrogen on? I said, no. He says, don't. You don't need any. I said, thank you. You know, we're lucky enough, but Rick's been our base for five or six years to build his database so I can send him samples. Don't cost me a dime. We send him samples every month, you know. But here's the corn from the no-till. 10 years of CRP, there is a little bit of weed there, just a little, not enough to hurt harvest, you know. I thought this was a great picture sitting in a cab with my phone, you know, whoops. Yeah, I guess Jay took it out. The yield monitor was have been the next picture. That corn yielded 208 bushels of the acre, had non-treated corn, had no starter fertilizer, no nitrogen, no herbicide, return per acre. I gotta tell you this one. Net return per acre, $496.83. Most profitable field of corn I've grown for years. You know? Who bad's only 10 acres? Who only 10 acres, right, Jay? <laughs> you know? So here we are planting beans. Lucas likes it big, so do I. The bigger the rye, the better it is. You know? Planter green, you don't have any trouble going through it. Now, if we had burnt this down three days ago and it would have been turning light blue, it would have been a bitch. All right? <laughs> it hairpins. It does everything but what you want it to do. So if you're going to kill rye, make sure it's brown before you plant. The problem is, Ohio's weathermen don't get paid enough. Because they'll tell us it's not going to rain for 10 days or two weeks. So we go out there and spread ahead of time because when rye's doing this, going to head, it removes an inch of rainfall out of the soil profile a day. You know? Now on the clay soils, that don't matter to me. But on the sandy soils that don't have a lot of water holding capacity, you got to manage it. So if it's going to be dry, you kill it ahead of time. So it holds that moisture. But our weatherman's always wrong, so you kill it, and then it rains, and guess what? That would be an August or a September picture of planting wheat. Not a May picture. Because it takes it that long to dry out. You know? We roll afterwards. You know, we got all kinds of rollers, all kinds of fun. We get people that order stuff that wants to try us out before we leave it. So, you know, this had to be a roller that Gabe Brown didn't like, because Gabe don't understand how to roll. You know? <laughs> He says it never gets warm enough. That's his problem, you know. So we bought that cheap and resold it for lots of money. I keep sending gate checks every now and then. But here's the soybeans growing. No more white mold, no more southern death. We talked about that earlier. Why? The raindrop don't splash the soil that has the bacteria that creates the problems. No holes in the leaves, no flea beetles, no soybean aphids because the rye tends to take the soybean aphid away. You know. What did you do back to? That's it. Okay. Again, just, you know, just look around. Would you rather see the green 
Of course, this is Triticale. This was uh, this was the December picture, if I remember right, Jay. This is his December flight. But look at the neighbors. Look at all the brown. Look at all the wet holes in the field. You know. And I say, why? You know, why can't we all listen and learn? Why can't we teach everyone to think outside the box? Are we all as comfortable as we could be? You know, as a conventional tiller. 